it's still morning here in Zambia. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for that amazing presentation. Uh, the previous speaker spoke very well on the perspectives from India. Well, in Zambia, this is now week four since we recorded our very first case. And there is now community transmission taking place in the capital city of Lusaka. And it has also gone in another province called the Copper Belt province. And we have been trying to uh, strengthen our surveillance, but it is proving to be a bit of a challenge because of the sensitization that we have to carry out in our communities. Speaking on uh, health and mental health, uh, we are very well aware that health is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. With the concept of with the concept of a lockdown or restrictions, there are a lot of challenges that are taking place in individuals' lives. World over, it is proven that people are finding it very hard to cope with all the strategies that are being put in place. And this is very normal. This is a very normal reaction because as human beings, we are a social being and we need to keep in touch with one another. This is proving to be very difficult for many people to cope with because COVID-19 in itself is affecting every individual at an individual level, from the highest socioeconomic class to the lowest socioeconomic class. When we speak about Zambia and our perspective, majority of our people cannot afford to go on lockdown because they live day to day. Their reality is on a day to day basis, which is m m the, the perspective that is even being shared from uh, countries such as India. Now, coming to how emotions and emotional well being works, it's not just as individuals that are going through this, but also as healthcare providers, we have a concern because. As healthcare providers, we have a very high threshold of asking for help. We don't ask for help very often. And when we do ask for help, it's often when it's very late. Also, as healthcare providers, we have a very strong resilience pattern. What does it mean by being resilient? It means how do we cope with day-to-day -day reality? Now, when, you, when we talk about emotions, we have to talk about the seven universal emotions which don't look at race, don't look at culture, we don't look at, uh, these emotions don't even look at socioeconomic class. These are emotions that are common to every, uh, please, every person out there. So these common universal emotions are found everywhere. Where, whichever country or whichever part of the continent you go to, you will find people feeling these emotions. And these emotions are anger, feeling very angry, contempt, having fear, uh, feeling disgustful, happiness, or sadness and surprise. Now, with human beings, we are very, very open to share our happiness. But when it comes to emotions such as fear and sadness, it is very, very hard to show it. We often don't like sharing sadness or showing fear. But that is the concern that everyone all over the world right now, including healthcare providers, are feeling right now. To add, we also tend to show our anger more often than we do our sadness. And because of that, it is going to be very difficult to help people more. Telling people to stay indoors is one thing, but explaining to people why is actually bringing out all these emotions that are leading to stress. Now, stress is your body's way of responding to any kind of threat, and COVID-19 is a threat. You may sense this threat or you may not sense it with an imagined force around you. And this is what's happening with a lot of media sharing all these news and bulletins all around us. And this is causing this fear. And many people are going into panic mode. And what's that, that alarm that is coming about is leading to fight or flight within communities, within families, within homes as well. And many people are also freezing when I say freeze, they mean, what I mean is they don't want to hear about this and they don't want to know about this. Why? Because let's look at a socioeconomic class where many of the world's population live, which is the low socioeconomic class. For them, it's about making sure there's food on their tables. For them, it's about making sure there's a shelter under, over their roof. And that is the basic that every human being needs. So when you talk about something like uh, COVID-19, and it's an invisible threat that people may not have perceived or may not have the privilege to know about because not everyone has access to media and information, they will not be taking it very openly. And this is why there's that complacency when it comes to sensitization in the lower and low middle income communities. Now, what does stress do? If we don't cope with stress, 
what is going to happen? Acute stress reaction will lead to what we call uh, a probability of having a brief psychotic episode. Now, this is something that everyone needs to understand. It's not very common, but with stressors that are not dealt with as they happen, there is a very high likelihood that the brain will actually be triggered into a brief psychotic episode. When we say brief psychotic episode, what do we mean? As psychiatrists, it simply means that you lose touch with your reality, how you feel, how you see, how you perceive your environment, and how you act and behave as well. This is actually affected when you, you are faced with day-to-day -day chronic stressors that you can't deal with. And this is what the concern is, that many people are actually at risk of this and may go through this as we are talking right now, as people are being put in restrictions and people are being put in lockdown. And what symptoms are going to come about? These are delusions. Delusions are false fixed beliefs. You know, having religious delusions, for instance, that are very, very common, feeling that, you know, um, having that connection with your spiritual self and God is very important. But then there is also that complacency to say, if we don't, uh, if we are not going to do these preventive measures, it's okay, God will come to our help, which is very true. But at the same time, that can overtake your logic and your perspective, and you may not comply with the preventive measures, such as washing your hands and staying uh, promoting physical distancing. This is the concern that comes about with uh, emotional well-being as well. And then again, this is the acute step. This is acute stress. This is what's happening right now as we're dealing with COVID-19. There is a huge concern that if we don't deal with the stress right now that everyone is going through, and as a collective, as communities, as individuals, and as healthcare providers as well, there is a high chance then when all this is going to come down, when the wave of COVID-19 goes down, we are going to have a surge of another wave, which is a mental health pandemic. This is going to come because the stressors have not been dealt with right now. And a disorder that we know very well with trauma, which is not dealt with very well, is called post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is basically a failure to recover after experiencing or witnessing a terrifying event which the whole world is going through. And this condition, post-traumatic stress condition, may actually last for months or years to come. This is why it is very important that we take through what we understand what health is, which is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. As we're dealing with COVID-19, as we're putting in efforts to prevent COVID-19 with all these measures polit uh, that political leaders are putting through, we also need to understand that we need to help each and every individual cope with the stresses that are coming about with COVID-19. Now, let me explain to you what health problems can be exacerbated by not dealing with the current stresses that everyone is going through, including healthcare providers. It can lead to depression and anxiety right now. It can cause sleep disorders, sleep problems, and sleep is very vital, a very cardinal part of your day-to-day -day living. You need to have adequate amounts of sleep for you to make sound and logical uh, decisions, and this will be affected. Another thing that we very well know as psychiatrists and neurologists is that sleep actually helps with um, immunity as well. And lack of sleep will actually lead to a lot of concerns with one's ability to fight off diseases. Other things that can lead to because of stress can predispose to a heart diseases as well as reproductive issues as well. These are concerns that people need to understand that as we're dealing with COVID-19 right now, we also need to cope with the current stresses due to COVID-19. Because let's talk about restriction. It's putting people in a space that people are not comfortable with. And this is leading people to be stressed and that stress is going to be overwhelming for them and that may predispose to a lot of other diseases. Now, this is a concern that we as mental health specialists have identified, and we know that a lot of people know. We know that before COVID-19, we had other emergencies such as climate emergencies, hurricanes. We have bushfires that are happening, but we know that with COVID-19, it's a world pandemic, and the consequences of mental well-being will be very, very much. Epidemiologists are actually... Uh, putting forward uh, other waves, as I mentioned, after we curb the COVID-19 wave, there is going to be a wave because right now all of healthcare has focused on COVID-19 response. 
and we have put aside all our elective cases. Elective cases are cases that need to be, that are planned in advance and they are not emergencies. They've all been put away. Clinics are not functioning as they used to. Chronic diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, as well as mental health diseases are not being reviewed in clinics as well as they used to. All these people need care and these people may end up with complications and these people will come in with complications at the after we the COVID-19 wave. Another wave that we are anticipating are infectious diseases that have been in our midst, such as HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, TB, all of these, we've made many, many strides for the past 20 to 30 years in trying to curb these diseases. Because right now we are all focusing on COVID-19, these other diseases, infectious diseases, are actually not being taken care of as they used to prior to COVID-19. And this is another wave that is going to come after COVID-19. So, and then finally, as all this is happening, it's the same healthcare staff and it's the same healthcare sector that is going to deal with all these waves. It will come to a point where the healthcare uh, individuals themselves are going to um, have what we call burnout and eventually they themselves are at risk, a very high risk of falling prey to mental health disorders. And this is why not just as individuals, even as healthcare staff, we need to focus on mental well-being right now as it's happening, because if we wait, it's going to be very hard because mental health is something that is not already being given uh, a lot of attention, and this will actually lead to a lot of challenges. So with that, this is why we have invited my colleague here, uh, right here from Zambia, and she just completed a two, uh, in fact, a three-week shift a three week back to back shift where this person was in the front line treating and looking after patients with COVID-19. This person, this doctor did not go home for a good three weeks. She just stayed in the hospital and was given a quarters right there within the isolation center where she was. And she just completed her three week uh, schedule shift back to back and now she's come back she's going to rest for 14 days and she's going to go back in the front line you can just imagine the toll that is going through the healthcare providers as well another thing i would like to let you know is because we have redeployed many of our health staff from the actual health centers the health centers themselves are working with limited staffing as well and they themselves are doing extra shifts so these are things that we need to understand and this is why we need everyone to focus right now so with, with this, I will invite uh, Dr. Chiala to come in and share her experiences as a healthcare provider dealing with patients who have tested positive with COVID-19 here in Zambia. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's an honor to share my experience at the COVID center as uh, Dr. Dalau introduced. Uh, there is actually a panic among us. Um, health workers and uh, I worked there for three weeks non-stop. I missed my home and society as a general with a whole panic going around but um, it was an interesting experience. It was an interesting experience and I will share from uh, my personal point of view and uh, stepping aside from uh, the medical aspects and I'll also focus on how that affected me. So um, the COVID-19 outbreak was, uh, was a sudden, so to speak, like nobody was prepared for this and it is a pandemic. Nobody was mentally really prepared for this because we've had other outbreaks, but uh, they weren't as bad as this. Focusing on uh, the SARS outbreaks, they weren't as bad like to affect the whole world and put everybody at standstill. So this was quite shocking. And we did, of course, we did foresee that this could come to Africa, but we didn't see that it would come to such a scale. And we also don't know the magnitude of how this will be and how it's turning out. And also because we don't know yet, we are like in a learning process on what we know so far about the COVID-19. So uh, we are in week four and uh, three weeks ago, I, four weeks ago actually, I was told that I was going to work at the COVID center and uh, so I prepared myself mentally and physically for what was coming in the preparation process. Um, I relied also on reading just a few books to keep myself away and to keep my sanity insane because it's, I knew it wasn't going to be easy and I didn't know what I was going to be expecting. 
And then through all this, I, I did acknowledge that I have a role to play in this as well as being a health professional. I have a role to play in uh, helping the patients who are going to be affected, but I also have a role to play in making sure that this disease does not spread to the community. I had to leave my house for that and I was mentally prepared. And then uh, after leaving home, um, I also acknowledge that uh, in as much as I have a role to play, but there's only so much I can do um, to control what is happening. So through all this, I got support from my friends and my family. So coping with that, I have a few points that I have um, written down here that helped me to, to cope through the time uh, being there. And also uh, I'm in quarantine and uh, there's a possibility of maybe going back to work there for another maybe two weeks. Uh, so, so through this, I, I, I spoke to my family every morning for emotional support and encouragement. Uh, I spoke to my mother every morning and uh, every evening before I go to sleep. So that, that was actually very good. Um, it was good. It was uplifting just to know that they're all fine and that they're rooting behind me. So I watched my stress levels and I didn't let that get the best of me. So by doing that, I was limiting my exposure to, to the news because there's so much happening right now. When you turn on almost every news station, they, they'll tell you everything that's happening about the COVID. Much of it is um, agitating rather than being informative. So I would limit my exposure to the news for at least an hour a day just to keep updated to what's happening out there. But I would do that not in the morning. I wouldn't do that in the evening either because it's not a good time to do that. So I would do that during the day, but I would also keep up with the latest journals that are being published just so that I am informed. Then um, also during the COVID center would work, uh, you'd be working practically, you are working 24 seven. There's no telling when they'll wake you up to go and review a patient. Apart from the general morning reviews, you just don't know when they'll call you to go and review a patient. And I must admit uh, that did affect my sleep cycles a couple of times. And um, at some point in time, I did lose track of day and night. Um, I just lost track of the time. What time is it? What time it isn't? But uh, I still got, at least I got that um, in control during this quarantine season, this quarantine thing. But also, uh, I made sure to look after my body because I knew if I'm not in my best shape, I wouldn't take care of the patients. So during that, I would do a little bit of physical exercises, a little bit just to get my heart pumping. And I mean, just a bit of cardio, less than 30 minutes every day. That would help me keep track and see what's happening. And um, dealing direct with COVID um, patients, you can't, you can't deny that there, there would be times when you get a little cough and you don't know what's happening and you think you're getting sick yourself. But um, luckily, uh, we were tested uh, from time to time and just to keep track that we're also safe and healthy. And I'm referring to we because dealing with this, I wasn't the only one there. We got people who were working there, uh, over at least over 90 members of staff were working at the center they were also away from their families so sharing that pain with everybody who was there and developing a team and being together as a family that really did feel good um it was the support that we needed because we were in the same shoes and working together knowing that you're trying to achieve a common goal that was really good so that's how i dealt with working at the COVID center so that's what i can share with everybody else and it's, it's good that everybody is uh, practicing, uh, well, most of the people who can are practicing social distancing and then you are seeing how the media is also uh, working out to see what challenges or what people can do at home to stay fit and see how they can best work at home, though it's not working for everybody else, but for those who are trying, it's really good and it's really motivating that this fight is not just for the frontliners and everybody who is involved is actually a, a frontliner because we have a role to play in preventing the spread of this disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Ch uh, Chiana, for sharing that. Uh, that is something that people need to understand that it's just as overwhelming as Dr. Chiana highlighted, that this is something that no, no one was prepared for. 
Initially, we thought this was a, a disease that was not going to spread as far and wide, but here it is in all most of the countries all over the world. And we are all, all really trying to get the best out of it. It's really good to see that there's so much community support, even from our previous speakers, to see that even the private sector has been fighting with us. And this is why there is more need for sensitization to be understood at every level not just um, for, for education for the sake of um, just prevention, but just making each and every person understand at their level. No matter how much education you have, behavior change and understanding is something that is uh, very difficult. Um, we will hand over to the uh, organizer now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalal, and thank you, Dr. Chiala, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the participants. Uh, the first question from one of our participant, uh, Cholville Lawrence. Uh, this is general panic in the world. What is the best way for frontline healthcare providers to protect their mental health in this season? What practical steps can they take? You know, that is, that is something that as healthcare providers, because we've gone through the training of health for so long, we build a resilience. Resiliency basically means your ability to cope with stressors and you bouncing back to your usual self after you cope with that stressor. So with healthcare providers, generally resilience patterns are very strong and very high. But the concern is when should you ask for help? This is the time, this, it's now. If you feel overwhelmed, don't wait, don't try to do it yourself. Every person needs to reach out. And the practical things that everyone can do is what Dr. Chiala has highlighted. Reach out to your friends and family now support ask for support if you feel you are anxious if you feel you cannot cope in the front line ask for help and it's no need you don't need to feel that guilty that you are asking for help this is when you need to ask for help because that is the only way you're going to cope emotional support is very very important reach out not just to friends and family but even people who are well wishers reach out to them and ask them tell them how you are doing Communication is very important. A social connection is very important. The other thing is reassurance. Make sure you understand your value, your human value, your capital value is one thing, but your human value, how much you mean to the world and to yourself right now. This is something you constantly need to remind yourself. And as Dr. Chiala mentioned as well, read things that calm you down. Use strategies that you've been using before when you were stressed that you used to use use them now as well and another thing is the three pillars of well-being and health in general your mood your sleep and your diet make sure you don't overgo that i know it can be overwhelming in the healthcare industry where you have to work shifts after shift but don't compromise on your diet as well make sure you have your meals so that your your nutrition level is up and another thing we'll ask you as healthcare providers is we are all here in one. There's no such thing as a COVID specialist anymore. All of us are in this together. So reach out to your friends in the department, in the communities, even right now we are a global network. Reach out to anyone, ask for advice and information. Another thing I'll also advise healthcare providers is please, 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 please focus on your network and focus in your region. Don't read news and breaking bulletins from all over the world. Focus in what's happening where you are in your, in, your, in your little bubble. Because what's going to happen is if you read something, for instance, as our speakers highlighted how they are treating in India, that may not be necessarily the case in our country in Zambia. So let's focus with the resources that we have right here and work with that. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Dalal, for the wonderful answer. And we have the next question, uh, which is being, there are so much of questions, so let me try to put the uh, last one. How really are we f uh, psychologically to deal with the aftermath of COVID-19? Do you foresee more mental-related disease after COVID-19? If so, what measures are we putting in place to prevent too many cases? How can we prevent depression in this period, as all news we hear is depressing? Very, very, well, I'll be honest with you, and this is a fact that the whole world knows, uh, investment in mental health is something that is not being taken care of. And right now, globally, mental health is not invested well. 
with any crisis. This is why the World Health Organization in 2016 issued what we call the psychological first aid. This is where when major, sudden, unexpected crises happen all over the world, something that we use in healthcare is triage and uh, first aid generally. But now we have what we call psychological first aid. This is just for times like this where every person needs psychological first aid, someone to understand them and someone to cope with the current stressors. As I mentioned in my talk, if the stressors are not going to be coped with now in the current phase, in the acute phase, acute meaning currently, these stressors are going to build up and they are going to lead to what we call uh, psychiatric and mental health conditions later on. Are we prepared for it? This is why even uh, an organization like Taxila has taken mental well-being so well, and this is why they're giving us a platform to raise the alarm and to raise the concern, not just raising an alarm, but to concern and how we can cope with it. And this is why even the World Health Organization in their strategies are focusing on how to cope with mental health right now. And also, as healthcare providers all over the world, we are also advocating and promoting mental well-being so that we don't have that wave of mental health afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Dalol. The last question from this session is, with regard to the psychiatric effects of the pandemic, how and what measures have been put in place for the frontline doctors and personnel in general as ZMA? Okay, so for frontline health workers, what is being promoted is we make sure that they are safe. As you're aware, unfortunately, it's very sad to hear that healthcare workers are also losing their lives. And over 100 nurses and doctors and healthcare providers, as of the 4th of April, have died and succumbed due to COVID-19. And that is spreading generalized anxiety amongst healthcare workers as well. So to cope that, what we've done and what many people are doing all over the world, especially the World Health Organization, we are requesting, and we're not just requesting, we are asking that we have adequate personal protective equipment because this is a barrier that will actually save us. That is what we're doing because for now, knowing that we are safe is going to help us focus better on our work. Other than that, we are also providing as much as possible social support in terms of how to cope with the stress on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, here in Zambia, Dr. Chiala and her colleagues right now are, are being kept at a particular secured um, place where they, should, they will be kept in um, observation so that should they be at risk, they don't spread the virus to their friends and family, because that is the major concern that also healthcare providers have, that how will we safeguard our friends and family should we catch the COVID-19. So that's another thing that also healthcare um, health sectors all over the world are doing. And we as healthcare um, mental health specialists are advocating so that every healthcare provider is taken care of. Another thing that we're very grateful, for instance, in Zambia here, we've got the community, the private sector, as well as the um, social community networks that are coming together and helping. For instance, Dr. Chiala and her crew are being supported by a local community-driven network called Lusaka Helps, where they basically send them food, they send them thank you notes, they send them things that makes them realize that they are not in this alone. We are all together. We are all fighting this together. So these are things that we're putting right now so that we cope with the burden in our healthcare. And we hope that all over the world, um, healthcare providers are being given the support. Also, social media is buzzing with uh, clap for the carers. This is also something that is very, very welcome. And we thank everyone. But right now, our cry is please make sure we have adequate personal protective equipment. And this is what's helping with curbing our anxiety. Fantastic, Dr. Ladal. The last question is, uh, uh, there is a connection between morbid obesity and the psychiatric issues. Please advise to go on weight loss diet during COVID-19 pandemic. Well, right now, what everyone needs to understand is there is no need to go on specific diets. You don't need to go out of your way to make yourself feel um, um, protected. All you need to do, and this is something that all healthcare providers will promote, is make sure your mood is being kept well. By your mood, I mean how you feel and your anxiety levels are, and your stress levels are kept well. One thing you can do is, as Dr. Chiala mentioned, avoid listening to all the news and all the networks and all the bulletins that are coming out. The second thing you need to do is make sure your sleep routine is being taken care of. Make sure you're getting your routine seven to 10 hours of sleep. Please don't be a night owl. Please make sure if you can 
sleep at night, make sure you do still manage to sleep at night. A lot of screen time is also not good. And finally, your diet. Your diet doesn't need to go out of your ordinary. What you used to eat prior to COVID-19 right now, as you're being restricted, also make sure you maintain your diet. This is something that your body has been used to and you make sure you keep focusing on that. If you feel you are eating excessively or if you feel you're not eating well, that itself is a sign that you are not coping well with your stress. So make sure you, you reach out to everyone with respect to your mood, your sleep and your appetite and keep that in check. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalal. I think we are done with the questions for now, I believe. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dalal. And thank you, Dr. Chiala for the wonderful presentation on the, uh, on the topic.